right. Welcome, everybody. Good evening. Um, I'll quickly go through this little presentation about a little bit about myself and, the, and, and what we're doing here at the hospital with the knee surgery and stuff. But we'll try to get through this so that we can uh, take a look at the actual equipment that we're using. So uh, very briefly, uh, this is a little bit of uh, about what I do. I'm an arthroplasty trained surgeon. I do hip and knee replacements primarily. Okay, we do primary replacements in the hip and knee. We do uni compartmentals in the knee. Uh, we're, I'm, I'm doing robotic assisted replacements. This is pretty much what the focus of the talk is going to be out tonight. Do some knee arthroscopy. And then um, at the hospital here, we take uh, general orthopedic call and, 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 uh, and help out the ER with uh, hip fractures, ankle fractures, pediatric fractures, and things like that. So it's a kind of a general practice. But 90% of, I would say 95% of my practice is with uh, the hip and knee replacements. This is my real pastime, <laughs> not necessarily the beer. If anybody knows about this, this is kind of a lousy beer, but the Steelers are certainly m my favorite sports team. So that's, that's the real stuff. So a little bit about Brandon Regional. It's about a 400-bed hospital. We have a specific orthopedic unit on the fifth floor in the A Tower, which is kind of, uh, I guess, diagonally down that way. But um, there's 30 uh, rooms. They're all private rooms, okay? It's an orthopedic and surgical unit. So the nurses up there are uh, certified in how to do orthopedics, and all of our post-operative patients go up to the, to the fifth floor. There's a physical therapy unit there. And since 2012, it's been deemed by different um, groups and insurance companies in this uh, an area of orthopedic excellence, and then also received the... Um, Adult Reconstruction and Hip Fracture Joint Commission uh, accreditation. Um, I think that was, we're in the, it's a two year thing, so I think we're in about four years. So it's about since 2012 that this has been going on. So it's a bunch of surveys. They come and evaluate. Uh, there's an, a, a person that evaluates the facility over a two day period. Uh, following patients preoperative, postoperatively meeting with staff and administration. So it's a pretty big, intense couple days, but um, we were certified, I think, about four years ago, um, or uh, three years ago, and then had the recertification that was uh, last year. So we're kind of in our fourth, about fourth year of this now. So it's a, it's a, it's a big thing for the hospital uh, to be able to, to get that done. Prior to that, um, we, we didn't have that recognition, so. Um, there's just a couple pictures. This is the, the, some of the staff. It's probably a little bit older now, but um, they're all private rooms set up. Orthopedic chairs in there, trapeze for the bed. So they're, they're tailored for orthopedic patients. Um, there's not any, uh, I don't have any disclosures relevant to this presentation at all. I have to always put that in. So today what we're going to talk about is basically knee pain okay so we'll get through the majority of this and then you know we'll, we'll uh, get, get into the uh, the meat of this and let you take a look at the robot but a little bit about knee arthritis treatment options non-operative operative, operative um, the surgery and then how are we doing the surgery with the the Mako robot so joint replacements are involved in everything that you do every day you walk in here you get up from a chair you walk to your car so bending moving, twisting, your hips and knees and lower extremities, very much your whole body is always involved. So when your knee becomes diseased or injured, such as an arthritic situation, doing all of those things can cause pain in your joints, in your legs, and limit what you're able to do or limit your functional ability. So a lot of questions that we get when patients come into the office is, can joint pain in my knee cause pain in another joint in my back? Or do I have an arthritic knee and do I have an arthritic hip because of it? Well, there's no proven literature that will say that my right knee is arthritic, so I'm going to have an arthritic left hip or an arthritic back. So that's not proven. What happens is when you walk with a bad right knee, you tend to limp, right? You tend to limp. So it throws off your gait mechanics, causing hip pain, causing back pain, causing pain in the other knee. So it, ne it doesn't necessarily cause arthritis, but it aggravates the underlying condition. So another thing that happens, why does my knee 
pain wake me up in, in the middle of the night? Or why can't I sleep? Why is my pain the worst at night? Well, typically what happens is during the day, you're up and you're on it and you're distracted or you're doing other things, you know, you're on the computer, you're working, you're shopping, you're doing this and that, you're moving around, so you're not thinking about your knee, okay? Plus, as the time goes by, you're on it more, you know, by the end of the day, you're at hour 10 or 12 or whatever, so the pain builds up, the inflammation builds up. When you go down to sleep at night and you're laying there, you're thinking, boy, I'm really tired, boy, my really knee really hurts, boy, I'm really tired, boy, my knee really hurts, and you're like, you can't fall asleep, right? In, in our post-operative patients, this is probably the biggest complaint is they can't sleep at night, and it's for those reasons, because you, you have no distractions, you're not thinking about doing anything else, you're not watching TV or reading, I mean, you're trying to fall asleep, and it starts throbbing because it's swollen from the activity of the day, but it's very, very common. And then, and then here's another thing that, that, that I hear probably very commonly is, I can tell when the weather changes. So people believe it, people don't. I actually believe it. And what it is is, you know how the, the, there's, when the weather changes, there's an atmospheric, like a barometric pressure change, OK? So there's, there's receptors in the joints, there's fluid in the joints, and you can sense that there's a outside pressure change because there's fluid shifts and things like that in the joints. Also, it's colder. The knee or the hip or any of your joints can sense that. They f you, you, you get a little, you, the muscle around it gets a little more tight. Uh, so so it's, it's a real phenomenon, I think. I, I, and, and, you know, it, there's not, you know, you, you can't say that, oh, it's going to be 62 degrees today because, uh, you know, whatever. But it's not that specific. But there's certainly a shift and some correlation with the, the atmospheric barometric pressure change. In, in the atmosphere versus, you know, and, and in your body. So you can actually kind of feel that. Um, so arthritic pain is, it can be constant, it can be intermittent, it can occur with movement, it can occur after movement, it can occur after rest. So, so typically what we see in an arthritic per patient is one that has uh, some stiffness in the morning, they kind of loosen up, they get through their activity, and at the end of the day, they're having more pain, and it, it starts to kind of cycle back later in the day after they've been real active. Um, specifically in the knee, since that's what we're talking about, can be localized to one area, the inside portion of the knee, the back of the knee, the front of the knee, or it can be just global knee pain, the entire knee. But it's generalized in aching pain and is surrounded most commonly around the knee joint. Anatomy of a normal knee, the top bone is the femur, the uh, bottom is the, the tibia. Tibia, right, the white is representing normal cartilage. It might be the center bone. Center. Oh, perfect. So femur, tibia, cartilage, meniscus, medial meniscus, lateral meniscus. So that's a healthy look. What happens in an arthritic knee is Arthritis is when the cartilage wears away. Cartilage is the shock absorber, right? So what happens is the cartilage is worn away. There's no shock absorber. When a patient stands, they load the joint, and the bone hits the bone. So that's really why it's painful. There's other things that go on. The knee swells. There's inflammatory markers and things like that in, in the knee that, that uh, also cause pain. But it's a mechanical problem here. The cartilage is gone, and there's no shock absorber for the joint. So the bone-on-bone -bone contact is, is really what most commonly is the thing that hurts. So just progression of arthritis. Early knee pain, the cartilage starts to wear a little bit. Sometimes people have degenerative meniscal tears. And treatment after they've tried, you know, rest and anti-inflammatories and everything, they get a knee arthroscopy to clean out the meniscus or, you know, clean out the knee. So, so, so that can help a bit. Um, as you pro progress along, you move to a more middle stage arthritis. So it involves one portion of the knee, one compartment here. Sometimes those patients, right, if you look on the lower part, this is a partial knee replacement. So a patient that has arthritis in one portion of the knee may be a candidate for a partial knee replacement, okay? So that's one of the things that we use the robot to do. As it goes along in this continuum here, you can see that there's progression of arthritis to the entire knee, the red spots, the and then that's where you end up with a full knee replacement. So some patients are candidates for partial, some patients are candidates for uh, what we call as a, a bicompartmental knee replacement, 
So you, you replace this medial compartment here and then the patellofemoral joint. Some patients, if they have tricompartmental end-stage arthritis, which is, pro is the most common by far, they end up with a full knee replacement, okay? So I would put the partials in, a, in my practice in a realm of about 25% or so of patients. Um, and uh, that is a, I, I do a lot of this. I think the robot helps to do it. I think it's a, it's, it's a good surgery for the right patient. And that percentage overall in the United States is probably a higher percentage. Probably if you go to average in orthopedic joint replacement surgeons, about 10% or so. Okay, oh, I just skipped through one there. So this is an, a radiograph, okay? Normal knee, uh, everything looks pretty, the lines are smooth here. I guess that's the best way to describe it. Joint space looks pretty good. This is a little narrowing here, but you can see the joint space is, the cartilage is what's, it doesn't show up on an x-ray, but that's the, that's the cartilage in there, the space is the cartilage. So that's a normal knee in contrast to an arthritic knee. You can see there's bone on bone here, there's bone uh, spurs that are formed here, and that's a, an, a pretty much end stage arthritic knee. So different types of, osteo of, of, of arthritis, okay? Osteoarthritis, by far the most common. 27 million Americans plus or rough number suffer from some form of osteoarthritis. Okay, it's the wearing out of the joints. Rheumatoid arthritis is a, is a genetic inherited condition that you have. It's an autoimmune condition and patients have blood uh, work done and they test positive w w for rheumatoid arthritis through blood work. Okay, it's a different type of, it's not really wearing out of the joint. The cartilage is de degraded by the immune process in the body. So it's, a, it's kind of a self-limiting type, type of a condition. Uh, Post-traumatic arthritis is something else. If you've had a knee injury or a ligament injury when you played sports when you were younger, you are more, more prone to getting an arthritic knee because of that trauma or that damage that was done. So some people, you know, they're 45 years old and they have a really bad knee or hip and they had ACL surgery and a cartilage transplant and all this, they're more prone to having a post-traumatic knee, post-traumatic arthritic knee. So those are the main three types. So this is just a slide basically showing that it's the most common cause of disability in this country is, is from arthritis. But when you have a replacement, you're not disabled. You're getting better, right? That's the whole thing. We, we want you to get better. Some people don't. Some people have, there's a small percentage have complications and things like that. But the overall idea of the surgery is to not make you disabled, right? Because you fix the knee, you put in the replacement, and then you're able to get back to that, you know, the functional things that you were not doing prior to that. Okay, so treatments for knee pain, non-operative, physical therapy, medications, diet and exercise, canes, walkers, therapy, uh, cold and heat therapy. This, this I tell patients, whatever really feels better for you, you know? A lot of times the heat's good before exercising and then cold after, once after, after you've done it to kind of decrease the swelling inflammation in the joint that can occur. Anti-inflammatories, injections, uh, there's different types of uh, injections, cortisone and visco supplementation, those are, those are some options. You fail all those things and then you're at, you know, at surgery. So the last thing here is what about cartilage replacement therapies, PRP, stem cell. I'm not going to get into that, but those are newer procedures. My personal belief is that there's certainly some role, but when, you know, if you go back to that picture of, you know, the bones hitting the bone, no matter what I inject into someone's knee, the bone's still going to hit the bone, okay? It might make you feel better for a little bit, but it's not going to increase that cartilage space. It's a mechanical problem. So, you know, these, these things, I think they have a role, and I think th that they're going to be very valuable in the future, but it, it's going to be, you know, certain situations, and there's a lot more to come on that, I think, with different, you know, with research and stuff like that. But it's, it's, it's not all there. It's other parts of it is that insurance companies, these are a lot of times, you know, these things are cash, okay? So, so they're not uncovered by any insurance companies or Medicare or anything like that. So they can be pretty expensive too. Um, so what, what plays a role in joint health, okay? Why does this joint hurt? Well, we talk about losing cartilage and things like this, but 
this is this to me is like a profound thing, and I I might even put it. But the bottom line of this, there's a lot on here. But the bottom thing, one, this is saying that one pound loss, okay, is like taking four pounds off your knee, okay. So that that that's I would even maybe put that higher. When you bend your knee, it's probably five to eight times, okay. So when you're when you're bending your knee and you're loading your knee and bending and the kneecap is that stress is on it, it's probably about you know, five, t five times this, probably like 20 pounds, really. So it's, it's 10 pound weight loss, five pound, it, it definitely matters, okay? It, it is very important um, to help maintain the motion of the joint. You know, if you're a surgical patient, you lose 10 pounds before surgery, guaranteed your rehab is going to be easier. You're going to have better, you're going to have, your motion's going to be better, your strength's going to be better, you're going to be able to physically rehab better. So, Certainly exercise helps the joint, but things you, you know, people you can't walk. Well, you do aquatic therapy, you do low impact therapy, you do a stationary bike, elliptical machine. Those are the things that you get around. Walking for exercise when you have a bad knee obviously is really challenging, right? It's hard to do. So the, the modalities we recommend are those, biking and aquatic therapy and things like that. So what's a knee replacement? So we don't cut off, you know, the top of the bone here and cut the bottom of the bone and put a new one in, right? <laughs> we get that question. What we're doing basically is shaping the bone to fit this metal implant. So there's a metal implant on the femur, metal implant on the tibia, and then plastic in between, and that's the bearing surface. All knees click, okay, because it's a metal and a plastic, and when they hit, they make a little noise. The patients feel it because it vibrates through their femur. So, But it's, it's, it happens in all post-operative patients. So what's the goal of a knee replacement? provide pain relief, biggest one, restore motion, and then the patient's function. Try to get you back to doing what you were doing before you had, um, had, had the pain and the, the condition. And mainly, fo fountain of youth. <laughs> That's what it does. Get you back to what you were when you were 25 years old. So, um, according to healthcare numbers, you know, there's probably somewhere in this, this realm of 600 knee replacements done each year in, in, in the United States. It's probably hip replacements, about two thirds of that. So, here's, here's, here's the meat of this, okay? This is an older picture, right? The guys, they, they don't look this cool. I mean, they, they look a lot cooler now, right? You know, here's an x-ray on the back of the room, right? We don't even use x-rays anymore. The, everything's on the computer. We got one, two, three, four stuff over here. This is cement. You know, we got, like, we got cameras in the lights now. They got, I think that's a camera up there. So this is kind of, I guess, what it used to be like. I don't know. <laughs> trays, one, two, three, four, five, six trays, you know. This is kind of a... I don't know, when I started doing this and was in residency, this was more of the setup. So what are we at now? This is our setup. Guys a lot cooler in the room, right? Less instruments. They kind of look fancy. They're a little sleek. The, you know, we got the robot over here, this kind of thing. The knee is in a flex position with this holder. Someone doesn't have to hold it. So it, a lot of advances. And this is, you know, 15 years or so probably rough, you know, somewhere in that realm. Trays, smaller number of trays. These are trials. We, you know, when we use this robot, we don't need the cutting jigs. You're able to cut without the jigs. So that's, that's one of the things. Um, so we really just need, th these, these things are the implants that we trial to make sure we have the right sizes and then the real implants are open per patient. So that's, that's kind of how we do it. Um, this is the robot here. We'll show you a little bit more, but this is, the, this is the arm here that does the, the bone preparation, okay? And then this is kind of all the software and the computers. And, and what we do is each patient, when they have this procedure, they'll have a CAT scan before. And the CAT scan is like the map, okay? Um, we then use the map or the CAT scan to be able to size the implant to the patient's bone. So not only is it 
you know, robotic, but it, essentially it is patient specific in a sense that we're, we're using this map to size the implants before we start the procedure. So we have a plan and basically so much work is done up front that when you get to surgery, you just have to execute that plan. That's, that's kind of the main thing. So how does it work? So like I said, I kind of got into it a little bit, but it's a personalized surgical plan based on a 3D model of your knee. So the CT scan's not 3D model, but the, the software is able to generate a 3D model um, that we'll, we'll, we'll see here on this screen that uh, based off the CT scan, it generates that model and then sizes the implants. The um, robot here precisely and accurately removes the bone, okay? So this, this thing, you can move it in certain directions, but you can't move it too far left or too far right. So it protects ligaments, it protects vascular structures, it protects the soft tissue because it limits you, it only resects, you know, I run the thing, I don't sit and have a coffee in the corner of the room. <laughs> but, it, you know, I'm able to, you know, I, I, I try to push it too far and it won't go, it blocks me. It's based off what's called a haptic system, so it doesn't do that. So CT scan. These are the different cuts of a CT scan and then you build the model. And then this is one of the screens. This is for a total knee replacement, okay? We were, this is a newer thing and, and, and there's, there's a limited release of this in the country right now. Brandon's one of the facilities where we can do a total knee, um, but we also do partial knees and you can do hip replacements with this system, okay? Uh, you know, obviously implants are different, but the, the, from the robotic side of it, you can do a partial knee, a total knee, and a total hip. Um, so in the operating room, it helps with the surgery, helps with the bone cutting. Uh, the plan is there, you know, you size the implant to fit the bone here, and you can look at different views. The top is the femur, the bottom is the tibia. Um, so then, you know, this is the x-rays. I would just say that the x-rays when we do this, because we have a plan and we know the sizes, are some of the best looking x-rays. That does not mean that the patient's outcome is gonna be perfect, right? Because we're just looking at an x-ray. They may have some soft tissue things. But, but from, from looking at a radiograph is really the way that we can, you know, objectively look at it. The, the implants are sized very well. They fit well. They look good on, on x-ray, okay? So if you know that's good, then, you know, that, that's, that's a good thing. Not saying that, you know, you still might not have some tendon pain inflammation in the joint, but Knowing that you 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 got this spot on is is you know that's good that's comforting in my opinion. So this this thing is a little jumpy. I apologize. So this is just that same picture. This is kind of the setup before we start. I'm going to show a couple pictures and video everybody. The food was okay and everybody's all right with that. <laughs> Right. It's not, I tried to make it pretty reasonable, I'm not, it's not gruesome, but uh, so, so this, is, this is the setup for a knee, so you have to have a communication between the robot and the leg, right? So th these, these pins and arrays go into the tibia bone and the femur here, so this, this part here is able to sense where the leg is, okay, based on those arrays, so that there can be the communication. This is a picture of a full knee. The top is the femur, the bottom is the tibia, and we've basically, this is our plan. Um, Jose and I, and um, Andrew, we, uh, they're in the back here, they're the guys from Mako and Stryker and bring the implants and do the planning. I mean, so they're instrumental in this process. We talk about this before we actually do the procedure. Okay, so we have our plan. We can adjust it and fine tune it as we go along, but we essentially, like I said, you have to execute the plan. Okay. So this is kind of that 3D model I was talking about with the implants. You can always see over in the corner here, we have three, three, and nine. Those are the sizes of the implants, but they're, on, they're fitting on the bone like this, and we're looking at the gaps and assessing kind of what this is doing. So let's see if we can try to run it. So Natalia, can you hit the um, bottom one there and then the top? Go ahead, hit the bottom too. It might be a little, uh, it's, I did this on a Mac and we had to switch over to a PC, but basically what's going on here is I'm looking at this screen, okay, and when I run the saw here, that's what's, the, 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 it's showing that I'm removing, the green is the bone. Once I've cut enough of the bone, that means I've done a, pro, a proper resection, 
Okay, see there's no cutting jigs or any block. We used to use blocks we put on there and then the saw goes through the block to cut the bone. Here we just have the retractors. So this is another one. It's kind of it's kind of catching up a little bit just because but that's kind of you get the idea right I'm looking at the screen and that's the plane that I make the cut in you know and the saw is obviously moving but then when we remove the bone it won't let me outside of this green zone so there's ligaments over here ligaments over here you know bad stuff up here so I'm locked into that spot I have to move it but that's so this thing is so accurate you're down you're cutting down to the it's less than a third of a millimeter is well, we actually we can change about a half a millimeter at a time when we want so to you change don't it. Cut ligaments or tendons no. At all. no. 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 You don't no. What about nerves? No, well the nerves the, the, I mean this is a standard knee approach you know it's been done for a long time. The nerves really aren't I mean you have to get some no, not the main side. I mean, everyone has superficial nerves in their skin and everything that have to be cut with the surgical approach to the knee. But everything that's major is in the back of the knee. Yeah, out of that way. So let's see. Let's try to go to the next one. Try to play that one. Oh, shoot. The bottom ones, I apologize. It's just not converting over. It's not working. Try the top. That's weird that the top one's working, but not the bottom. So the blue's the saw blade, right? And the cut has to be, once it goes green, you can kind of move. So we're, if, they, if you see some red in there, I'm so good that I never get red, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's like, it's a it's a half of a millimeter that it's over resected. It's 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 like a it, you know, not even the width of the saw blade. It's like you know, put a couple hairs together, and that's about the the amount that's uh, been uh, over resected. So, but the kneecap is to the side actually. The kneecap is over to the side here. It's kind of just pushed to the side. Yeah, yeah. You have to do that to, so like on this model, it's like you're looking down at the tibia kind of, so the kneecap is sitting right in this area, right here. You have to get into the knee somehow. The easiest yeah. access into the so knee is from the inside of the knee is how you do it. So how would you be doing that without the robot? The so how do we do, what's the difference? Yes. That's a good question. I should probably show that. Mm -hmm. you, you basically, you take cutting blocks or jigs and you put them on and then you pin them into position. Okay? And when you pin them into position, then you put the saw through the slot in the cutting block and it resects the bone. So, and, and specifically when you have to do this on the, uh, you know, there's different ways of doing it, but sometimes you have to instrument, put an instrument into the canal of the bone and then you base the, the jig off of the instrument that goes into the bone. So with this, you don't have to put any instrument into the bone and whenever you put anything into the bone, the inside of the bone actually bleeds a lot. So what we found in doing these two is there's like less blood loss um, because we're not using, we're not drilling any holes into the bone. We're just cutting the superficial kind of, you know, making it like a, you know, like a trapezoidal shape. So the, the cutting jigs aren't utilized in this, which is actually good because it minimizes the number of trays and, the, and when you have like four surgeries in a day, it, you decrease the, the, the amount of turning all these trays over and reprocessing them and everything. So there's some benefit to that too. So it's so, I think also that, um, let me see what else I have here. We're getting towards the end. Um, this is kind of, try that. This is not going. It's not, it says unavailable, something happened to it. I was gonna, it's just taking the, uh, the knee through the range of motion and that's kind of what it looks like when it's, when it's done. So we got metal here, plastic and the tibia and the patella is here, so that's pretty much pretty much what it is. I don't want to go back to one question about yeah. what I just asked before. So when you have the jigs, it's a trial and everything. You put them on first, cut, and then try and fit right. up a, a, a piece? Yeah, another, another good question. So what we do is we, we have, there's instruments that measure the size. Okay, we don't have a CT scan 
to look at the computer in a 3D generated model. So during surgery, you take a sizer and measure what is the, the, you know, the diameter of the femur, or how big is the femur from the top to the bottom and the size. So there's a little, I don't want to say guesswork, but a little more, that's what, you know, it takes years to be able to do this, right? And kind of recognize what size and things like that. So this, you have a CT scan and you're looking at exactly what it is, you know? It, it takes a little bit of the guesswork out of it. So the surgery time for normal replacement is how long? I mean, that's, um, to, to do a knee replacement, yes. hour, hour and a half. And with this is? A little bit longer. Longer? A little bit. Well, for me, a little bit longer right now because I've done probably like 800 knee replacements without it and uh, I've probably done with this robot, I don't know, 200 or so or of just knee replacements, I think we're at about 8, 10-ish. I mean, we just got this robot for knee replacements in February. So this is a this is a newer thing, but my uh, my my point is like you have to know how to do a knee replacement to do this. I mean because it all depends on how you're sizing, measuring your gaps and the balancing and this and that. If you don't know that, this isn't going to be any good. You know if you give this good data and you're able to, you know, you you know how to do it and what it should be like, this will help. The times have gone. I mean, we, it, they get better each, it's just a kind of a little bit of a new way of doing it. Well, it takes a little bit longer, right? Once you get really good at it, it should I agree, and that's my thoughts. Yeah. That's why I do it. it would, because you don't have to pin these things into place, and you're just going into, it, it's, it's, if you look back at it, I'll tell you what has been our <coughs> biggest, my biggest um, kind of s slowing me down a little bit. Is, is how to put the, you can see, there's, you know, that's one person operating. There's nobody holding anything. Okay, so there's this special leg retractor that's new. Uh, these, these, these are like bungee cords that hold the retractors out of the way. So it's like, it's, it's, it's a knee replacement, but it's kind of like a different way of doing it. So when, it just takes time to learn how to put these in the right spot. It just is a learning thing. But I see a huge benefit to it being faster as the numbers would increase, yeah. Yeah. So what you're saying is that in order to do this correctly, you have to have the experience. Of yes, the yes, way. yeah. You can't just, well, I mean, if you're, you know, you look at something in the past, uh, before I started, they would do open procedures for a meniscal tear, okay? I only learned how to do knee arthroscopy, just scopes, right? So we didn't have to do it the other way. So, I mean, I don't know if it will ever get to that advanced, but you're gonna have to be able to do a manual knee replacement. You have to know how to size these things, how to you know, put them in the right spot. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, you, and there's special training too. You have to go to different <coughs> courses. I mean, we- you have to learn how to work before you can Yeah, it. yeah. Are you the only doctor that does this with the robotic arm? At this hospital, yes. Uh, but there's there's multiple surgeons at different places that but do it. Do Tampa know? General locally, um, different different facilities uh, around. Th this, it's actually been um, becoming a lot more popular in Florida. Florida's been the biggest boom with with these um, robots compared to pretty much any other state. How do your fellow orthopedic doctors view this that aren't using it? I, I think everybody wants to let no. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Maybe you got. I, I mean, I think that. Some people say you don't need a robot. I do a really good knee replacement. I've been doing it for 20 years, and my results are really good. You know, um, so I think that's going to be part of it. Some people say I can do it faster. Um, I, I've been doing it for a long time, and my patients do great. Which it's true. I mean, I've been doing it for eight, nine years before uh, I did this. But I think that, you know, if you look at the trend of everything, you know, I showed that x-ray. We don't use x-rays. We use computers now. Um, what else? The, the, in, in my world, the charts, there's not charts anymore. It's all medical records, electronic medical records. You can see everything on the computer now. So, 
I mean, we know what robots and technology has done for every industry, right? Every, you know, cars, everything, phones. That, so, I mean, I don't know why it wouldn't happen in the medical field, too. I mean, this hospital is making a big push for kind of robotics. There's a Da Vinci robot here. I don't know if you're familiar with that. That's more, that's out of my uh, scope of things, but they have a Da Vinci robot here where the general surgeons and, um, and, and there's some like urologic procedures and uh, gynecologic procedures that are done through the Da Vinci robot. So it's a totally different thing, but I mean, my, my opinion is that, you know, like I said, everything else has gone that way and we've seen a benefit from it. So. The advantage is that you can be more precise. Right, this. correct. More precise more accurate with the cuts. I think that we're getting to size these and fit these better with the CT scan. You can simply, like, if you don't, if you're not happy with how this cut is, you can change it by a half a millimeter or a millimeter. I mean, you know, we, we did them today. We did two today and we changed two of the plans or one of the plans in surgery. Two, yeah, two of them so that, you know, it's like, you know, I think this could be a little bit better and then, you know, you can do it very simply. So, yeah. Is there, is there a different robot for him? No, it, it's the same robot. Different software. Different software. And then the, you, you use more of a grater, like uh, for, for, the, for the hip, it's a, kind of a whole nother talk, but you have to kind of, uh, to put the socket in, there's a grater and it's attached to the robot. So when you go in and you do the grating for the acetabular, the cup portion, um, it, it holds you in that position. So you set the parameters where you want it to be and then you put it there and then and that's it. But you have to drill into the bone for the other part, or do you? For, there, right, that, that part is, that, that's more of a plan, that's more of a, it gives you a template, a size, and things like that. The robot right now does not do anything for the femur on a hip replacement. It just gives you the sizing and the length and stuff. PK and the hip. Yeah. So, so this is a this is a grater. This is an acetabular grater. So it gets hooked on to the robot, kind of, you know, on an arm here, and then this is what prepares the bone for the socket for the hip replacement, and then. And, and it will lock you into a certain degree. So I want 15 degrees and 40 degrees, and it locks me there, and I can't move it. So it's just about the precision of the whole thing is really the bottom line. Yeah. So, do you, uh, can the patient be awake? Can the patient be awake? Can you use the blocker? Well, theoretically, yes. Have you ever done it that way? I don't like to do that because I, I, I think that, um, these procedures are done with, a, I think, better with the patients asleep because then you can kind of get complete, um, what if like, they can't be asleep? if they can't be asleep, well, that's a different scenario because they, they can't be asleep for medical reasons. That would be a council with other doctors and an anesthesiologist and then discuss what we could do. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a complex thing. We would, you get, you, you make a plan that's best for a patient like that that has those medical conditions and yes. Is Sarah, you're, actually, you're up here. Yeah. How is the implant adhered to the bone? With uh, in a knee replacement? Yeah. The so knee that two two different ways. Um, I I most commonly I use a like a a, a, a bone cement, okay. and and it here adheres to the back of the implant and then in, in, interdigitates into the bone. Um, you can also do um, what's called a press fit, where it's, uh, there's porous coating on the back of the implant, and then you uh, impact it on, and then the, um, the bone grows into that porous coating on the back of the implant. That's kind of a surgeon preference of how they like to do joint replacements. And what kind of metal? Yeah, here's, a, here's the coating on the back. That's an actual hip replacement. So the, so the uh, you can pass that around. If you want. The um, bone grows into the back of that. And what kind of metal? Is it like titanium? So there's titanium, there's cobalt chrome. Most commonly knees are cobalt chrome. Hips are more titanium, cobalt chrome combination. There's different things. It's not so just the titanium. Decide? How do we decide? Majority of these things are cobalt chrome because they have the best duration, uh, dur durability. The titanium is a little bit of a softer metal. So sometimes um, patients have allergies and we have to go with specific implants and things like that. But standard knee replacement, 
tibias, cobalt, chrome, what's the, what's the, I mean the femurs, cobalt, chrome, tibias, tibia, titanium. titanium. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And how, what's the duration, 10 years, 15 years? I, I, I tell patients for a full knee replacement, 20 to 25 years, roughly. 20 to 25. Yeah. We, we, there's some, there's the, 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 like if you think about it, and, and what our literature has shown over years is about 1% um, of patients have, have a, a problem with their knee per year, roughly, in the big picture, not like in someone's practice, but like in the United States, 1%. So when, by the time you have that knee in for 20 years, 80% are usually still in functioning. So it's 1% per year, if you could think about it like that. So that's a pretty good, pretty good number. I think that with the, and, and, and that with the more modern bearing surfaces and implants we have, I think that number might be a little longer. So a lot of questions. Is, uh, is the invasive, uh, is this as invasive, uh, say, as a knee replacement done eight or nine years ago? I think, yeah, good question. I think. I mean, the incision and the exposure is kind of about the same. I think that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, incisions were larger, okay? They were bigger. Now, some patients need larger incisions than others, okay? Based on anatomy, based on size, based on like a lot of, you know, factors. Have they had prior surgery before? But I think that, that as far as invasive, I think because you're able to cut the bone more precisely and protect those ligaments, I think it's less invasive. And I, I've seen in the recovery with the patients, we, we had a, today, yesterday we did, a, you know, this is just, you know, it's anecdotal stuff, this doesn't happen to everybody, but I did one of these yesterday on a patient, he's in his 80s and he left today. So like, you know, that's pretty good. So rehab. 24 hours in the hospital, I mean. Rehab would be perhaps if Shorter of time rehab? Well, I think rehab is, you know, it depends on how the patient does it, how, how you know, regu religiously they're doing it. But um, I think that when you feel better, you can do more, more early, er, earlier, you can do more. And that leads to a quicker recovery. So I think it's kind of a, kind of a spectrum of, a, of all the above. Yes? Um. Um, I would, I don't know the answer to that. I, we've not had, an, this hasn't, that hasn't been studied at all. But I mean, I just in my head, if I think about it, you know, I talked about how if you have several in a day and you have to flash different pans and instruments and cutting jigs and things like that, then yes, because you don't have to do that for this. You don't have those extra instruments to have to utilize and send through the sterile processor and all that. So, I mean, you still have an open, you know, you, you have an open knee prosthesis, you, the implants are going in and things like that. So there's still an inherent risk of infection when you have a procedure like this, but you don't have those extra instruments that have been processed. So I, I'd probably say, yes, it'd be something that'd be interesting to study, I think, at, at some point. So this would even be recommended, would this be recommended I don't, I don't, I couldn't say that. I don't think so. Theoretically, I think it could potentially be an advantage, but I, I, I couldn't say that. No, I don't, I don't structure my patients and say like, oh, this is a diabetic patient, they should have robotic. Okay. Um, but I mean, I, I, it's such at its infancy right now with this for, for, for the full knee. How long have you guys, where's Jose? Jose, how long has the knee been? I mean, we just got it here in February. They've been doing them at Tampa General because my partner is on the design for it for a while, but public release was in March. Yes. So, so, so this was released to the public this past March at our big orthopedic meeting in San Diego. So I got a hold of it a little bit in, you know, a month and a half before that because I've been doing a lot of the partials and hip replacements with it. So, I mean, it's, it's so new that we don't have numbers to studies on it yet. So. so that's last month, right? Yeah. yeah. Last, month. last month. Me? Eight to ten. Eight to ten. 
Yeah. Would you ever do two at the same time, two movies? Very rarely. That has, that is more of a that's a patient specific thing that I would determine with the patient because they would have to be, you know, very healthy, uh, have good family support, um, n you know, no diabetes, heart problems, anything like that. What we see with bilateral hip, it used to be pretty popular before, but now we're doing just sing stage amount of time, six, eight weeks apart, maybe three months. We, we found that there's a lot of literature that says bilateral knee replacements increases the, you know, the blood clot risk, the ICU stays, the, the uh, uh, blood lo blood loss and need for transfusions and things like that. So that, that's not as common as it used to be in the 80s and 90s now because of the, the literature and the problems you see post-op. It's so hard to walk with bilateral knee replacements after, you know? What, ha what we see is that, you know, they take additional time to heal up three, six months than it would be a single knee. And it just is, um, you know, they catch up eventually and they're done and they don't have to have two procedures, but it's pretty rare. But that's, I, you know, I can count on probably one hand the number I've done in the, in the eight, nine years that I've been doing this, so. Is, is pain any less with this procedure? You don't know yet? I, I mean, it's still going to hurt, you know. <laughs> but, but, but. The, but the thing is, I mean, we, we like I said, we're, we're the patients, we do a lot of blocks and intraarticular injections, pain medication and injections into the soft tissues and everything. But, but no, truthfully, like, I think that because we're able to just make these cuts, we don't have to drill, uh, uh, enter the canal. I think that's painful. Um, I think there's more blood loss and swelling associated with that. So these tend to swell less. Um, they, they seem to get up and start moving quicker. And I think it's because you're just cutting the bone, you're not disrupting all that soft tissue envelope around it, you know your plan, you're not, I mean, it just, it, it, it's, you know, I think we've been, I've been adopting that philosophy when I do a regular knee, but now this seems to be, I mean, who would think that a, a person in their 80s can go home from a knee replacement? I mean, he just left the hospital, I saw him upstairs two hours ago, so. You know, he's 84. So Pretty good. So what you just said about not having to do the cuts and, and the other things, that's the minimally invasive portion of, of this machine, correct? Right, right cuz you're just cut you know what you're doing, you're cutting, you're not you're not taking a drill and going into the canal of the bone. That that's stuff. Minimally invasive is not just the incision. It was, a, it was a misnomer from before. It was a kind of a, you know, I, I believe, like a marketing thing. You make a small incision, it's a minimally invasive surgery. If I make an incision this big that you see on your skin, and then I disrupt all the tissue in an envelope this big underneath that small incision, that's not minimally invasive. It's, it's how you do everything from the skin to the bone. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. Yeah. You still do the normal? or you just I do do the normal. Yeah, I don't do this on everybody. Yeah. So downsides to this, okay, this sounds like the best thing in the world, right? So I gotta give the other side. The patient needs a CT scan, okay? So you're exposed to a little more, it, technically a little more of radiation, but it, it's not, a CT scan is not a lot of radiation. Two, will the insurance company approve having a CT scan done? We haven't had a problem with uh, any of them, but theoretically that could be something that would be an issue. Uh, there's a little bit of planning with it. So our turnaround time is pretty good. Two weeks, oh, how long? Two weeks, we'll two weeks roughly. You indicate a patient for surgery, get the CT scan, and we're ready to do it in about two weeks, pretty quick. Um, what if the robot goes down? <laughs> we got another one we reel down the no. <laughs> So, So you got to go to your manual instruments. So those are. So you still have some of that stuff yeah. with you. Yeah. Where's Medicare and uh, the insurance company? There is, I have not had any issues scheduling any patients for this procedure or with the CT scan. So what's the cost differential? None. Not, oh, same the CT scan. That's it. Everything else as far as you're concerned is covered by Medicare? And yes. So is everybody eligible for this surgery or are there cases where you um, some cases where I don't do it is if the patient's had prior surgery hardware or plates and screws, uh, 
there's not a revision platform at all. So if they've had a prior knee replacement and they want to have this done, or if you have like a partial there and you need to have a full knee done, those are some of the things. It's usually a prior surgery. If there's, you know, some patients come in and they, they have a really bad deformity and bone loss and all this, then we go with, we have to go with different instruments and stuff like that. This is, this right now is for pretty much a primary knee replacement. Uh, but I think, you know, with, with the design and research, and I hope to be, in, you know, kind of more involved with it is more, more revision type stuff, redos, the more complicated stuff, because I think that will, this will help. No, about the same. Yeah. No. How much does it cost? How much does the, you got to talk to the administration at the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Me, nothing. Just, just curious. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good, it's a good, I, I, I don't, good yeah, it's, it's a, you know, big piece of equipment. He wants to buy one. If you've had uh, meniscus sweep, if yeah. you've had meniscus sweep here prior, like my wife has, are you still yeah. eligible for something? Yeah. Like yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Ready for it? <laughs> right away. You know. But all right, uh, I think that's pretty much and yeah. Two questions. Yeah. Can a knee replacement be replaced, as in like a revision? As in like 25 years of right. So what can happen? So we went to the picture where you have the. See if I can get to one of those. I guess I can use the X-ray. So this is the metal component, and uh, for the femur and the tibia, in between is a plastic bearing surface. Okay. So what happens in some patients is they wear through the, bear, the plastic. And when you wear through the thickness of the plastic, 9 millimeters, 11 millimeters, 13 millimeters, and then you know, that's what's put in initially. And then you go in 15, 20 years, you're super active on it, and you wear it down to 10. As long as the components, the metal components, are still well fixed to the bone, and they're still in the same position, you can take out the plastic and put another plastic piece in. Okay, so that we do do that. It's more common in hips, hip replacements, because the bearing surface is on, on the hip, the plastic in the, in the socket of the hip wears out, and we do head and liner changes quite often. But yes, you can, you can change out that, you know, the analogy is a tire change almost. The bearing surface has changed, yeah. Um, right, it is manual. I, I run it. We'll show you that here. That's probably the best. Basically, so my hands on, we're on the trigger here. The saw blade is uh, here. And, and what it does is I have to push it forward and back and move it. But what the robot does, and I, and I hit the trigger, it, it makes, it, it uh, keeps me within this green plane. I cannot go this way to the right. I cannot go this way to the left. And I cannot change my position of my hand either way or go too far this way. Or it just blocks it. It just, it's just a hard stop. Arthritis continues, though. So I mean, your bone is still being deformed. In a, in a full knee replacement, the arthritis is cut out. Yeah, it's gone. The cartilage is gone. You don't have any more cartilage after a knee replacement. So your arthritic knee is gone. People can still have pain in their knee because there's still tendons, there's still joint um, inflammation, synovial tissue that can become inflamed. So it can still, you know, have some issues from time to time. But the idea, you know, of a knee replacement is not to make give you a knee that you had when you were 20. It's to relieve the pain and be able to let you walk better than you know how you were before. So. What's the normal so my, my, my thing is everybody is different. Everyone has a common cold. They recover in five days. Some recover in 14, you know. So 
In general, on a full knee replacement, we see that patients are getting back to more normal things at about six weeks, okay? Driving four to six weeks, uh, back to work six weeks roughly. Some people take longer, some are shorter. The, the knee, by, by, without a doubt, is still healing at six weeks. You're not completely recovered. You know, this, there's still swelling in the knee, the tissue's still healing, the incision's still healing, everything. You're still building your strength with therapy. So at six weeks, people are pretty good. I think that I always do a six-week visit for my patients. They do pretty well. They're off of canes, off of walkers, starting to get back into things, going back to work, and then a three-month visit. And at the three-month visit, 90 five percent of the patients are feeling pretty good and you know we let them go until a year we always like to get an x-ray at a year to just make sure everything's going okay Is that the same for a hip? yeah pretty much hips are a bit quicker um, they're they're they you know seem to be a little less painful than a knee the theory with that is that hip replacements are deeper in the joint and, and uh, deeper in the body with a lot of soft tissue coverage and they're protected a little more Knee replacements are very, everybody can feel their kneecap, right? You know, it's very superficial. There's skin covering your kneecap. It's not, it doesn't have a nice soft tissue envelope like the hip does really, that's pr more protected. So the hips, hips are a little quicker, so, but. That said, uh, the, after the surgery, all the metal detector alarms, the airport that was That was like my last slide. <laughs> <laughs> I, we're, I wanna get Dr. Ling up here to talk to, but sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, okay? Depends on the patient's height, size, weight, uh, scanner no, at the airport. The so, no, <laughs> there's no cards. They, they, you can't give them a card and it's a free pass to get through every the line, you know? It's just you get wanded or you go through that newer one that spins or it shows like an x-ray, it shows you have a knee. So, so there's no, there's, there's, it's just the process of going through. The, the weather? After yeah, so like after the knee replacement, it's the same kind of thing. The, the, the sensing, the barometric pressure changes and things like that because you've had surgery, you have some scar tissue in there, you still have the fluid, the shifts and things like that, the tightness in the joint. So it's very similar to just having a regular arthritic knee. You still can kind of feel it with a joint replacement in too. So, so I'll take a bunch of questions after, but I want to get Dr. Ling up to just to...